Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to r slash malicious compliance, where people follow others' orders to spite them. And in today's episode, guys, people are learning lessons left and right. I hope you enjoy the stories today. Hit subscribe if you haven't. And as always, you can send or link your post to this email right here. So back when I was a teenager, around 14 years old, I worked for a shop down the road as their weekend baker, which was mainly defrosting pre-cooked items, browning pre-cooked bread in the ovens, etc. My boss's daughter also worked there as checkout staff. However, she would always call in sick or hungover every weekend, so of course her dad would let her off the hook and make me cover her shift. So I would work 5am to 7pm most weekends. So after a couple of years, I decided I was quitting, and gave them my two weeks notice. It was at that point, my boss asked me to stay an extra week, to help train the new weekend baker, which I agreed to. At the end of the third week, I went into my boss's office and did the usual, well, it's been great working with you, blah blah blah. To which my boss replied, so, OP, the extra week you work to train the new baker means that you have been here for two years, which means according to policy, you need to work four weeks notice instead, so I'll see you next week. Also, you need to give us back your uniform on your last shift, and it needs to be freshly cleaned. Now being a petulant teenager who was tired of waking up at 4am, I stared at him in disbelief for a couple of seconds, waiting for the stupid grin on his face to fade to a laugh and him just saying, just kidding, have a good one, and good luck in the future. But that moment did not come. So I walk out of the office, stripped down to my boxers, folded up my baker's whites, my trousers, and even the little mesh fedora on top and walked into his office again and dropped the uniform on his desk and walked home. The guy then follows me down the stairs and through the shop screaming how I would never work anywhere again. Thinking back, that must have been a strange thing for customers to see. Also, it was a 10 minute walk in the summer sun, so nothing arduous. Apparently according to his daughter who got back in touch with me a couple of years later, I'm now one of the stories that my old boss tells people when he's had a few drinks. And not in a nice funny story way, he hates me. Oh my goodness guys, that boss sounds horrible. Like imagine thinking that you're so in the right that you tell all of your friends and family about the teenager that you tried to exploit. If I were in OP shoes, I would have made a huge scene in front of the customer saying, Sir, I don't want to work naked in your kitchen anymore. You need to find someone else to make those damn holes in the donuts. I'm just kidding guys, I don't have the quick wits or even the guts to say something that ridiculous. Okay, so I think this falls into this category, but it all started with me purchasing a lawnmower at a big box hardware store. In the interest of keeping them anonymous, let's just call them Rob Lowe, or Lowe's for short. So I walk in one day, looking to finally purchase a new mower, and I was in luck that they had a smoking deal on a display model. Unprepared to be going home with a new mower that day, I didn't bring my truck. So I simply asked if I could set it aside and come back in a little bit with my truck. I returned maybe 30 minutes later and picked up my mower and headed home. Now this should have been the end of the story, but weirdly, it isn't. So fast forward about two weeks later, and I get a call from Lowe's informing me that my mower is ready for pickup. Confused, I reply, uh, pardon me? So they reminded me that I ordered a mower two weeks ago, and it just arrived and it's a waiting pickup. Now I know most would have seized the opportunity right there, but I decided to be a good person and I explained to the employee that no, I didn't order a mower. I bought a floor model and set it aside to pick up later, which I did. The employee thanks me, apologizes for the confusion, and says that he'll update the order. Well, one week later, they call again, the same thing, and I once again explain why it's not mine. The week after that, they called me again. They did this once a week for three weeks straight. And after the third time, I just tell the wife, I swear, if they call me again, I'm just gonna go pick up my mower. At this point now, I'm just excited. I'm watching my phone, hoping they'll call, because in my mind, I've earned it at this point, and I want my free mower. Well, lo and behold, week four hits, and guess who calls? I am now ready to accept my free mower, but I am also unsure how this is gonna play out. I don't know if it's paid for, I don't have a receipt, and it seems like a long shot. So I simply tell the employee that I'm so sorry that I haven't been in yet to get it. I got called out of town for work, and I just got back. With that said, I have no idea where I put the receipt. The employee kindly replies, oh no worries, it's paid for in full, so all you need is a photo ID matching the name on the order. And I think to myself, perfect. 
I'll just call the wife to let her know that I'm picking up our new lawnmower. At that, my wife just laughs. She's still positive that once I get there, they're gonna figure out the mix-up and I won't have a lawnmower. But you'll be happy to know that I pull in, tell the customer service that I'm here for my mower, show them the ID, and the next thing you know, some guy's on a tow mower and he's loading a brand new, in-the-box, unassembled mower into the back of my truck. And off I went. And I still have that mower today. Now I did think about returning the original afterwards, but I just got nervous that it would somehow raise the alarms. Then I was gonna sell it on Marketplace, but shortly after all this, I bought a new house. And my best friend put in a lot of hours helping me move, and he too had been looking for a mower, so I just gave it to him as a thanks for helping me. I still ended up with a brand new, really good mower for essentially 60% off, and was also able to pay for movers with the original one, so it's still a win-win. Now I did genuinely try telling them that it wasn't my mower, but they insisted it was. And it would be rude to refuse the offer. Guys, I don't know about you, but I would feel so guilty picking up a lawnmower that I know's not meant for me. Like someone at Lowe's is definitely dropping the ball hard to not change the order status to completed after Opie talked to them like three times. And guys, the comment section is flooded with people just saying that this has happened to them, and everyone's saying what they got. Like, it's everything from small items up to thousand dollar TVs and outdoor furniture. We've been living in this apartment for three years. It's old, it's cozy, and the building is 20 years old. And though the appliances and the wall paint and carpets have been replaced, the floor hasn't. It's painfully thin. Every time we take steps, it creaks and groans, and it's annoying. Living on the third floor, we know it's got to be even more so for the people living below us. So we've done our best to be mindful of their comforts and try not to make too much noise. We've had a new downstairs neighbor move in a couple of months ago, and she's not convinced that we're literally tiptoeing around the apartment. Every time I get home and close my door, she's banging on my floor with a broom or something. Every time I cross the living room, it's banging, and every time I vacuum, it's banging. Every time my dog chews on a bone, you guessed it, she bangs on the dang floor and it scares my poor dog. We've been living on eggshells trying to be courteous and walking around really quiet, but she's driving us mad with her insistent banging every time we take a step. Now I guess she finally had enough because she came upstairs to yell at us the other day. She was screaming, stop being loud. You're too loud. You need to be more courteous and walk normal. You have neighbors. The woman was yelling so hard that she almost looked like she was gonna cry. It was disturbing. And we did feel bad. My husband tried to explain that ma'am, we do our best to be quiet, but these floors are really old and they creak. We're not stomping or jumping or running. We're living. But we will continue to be considerate. And she wasn't impressed with that answer. And she continued arguing saying, well, I've lived on the first floor before and my other neighbors weren't as loud like you. It's so loud, and my job is so stressful, so I want you to stop stomping. I don't want to be a mean person, but you're too loud. Just walk normal. So do you know what we agreed to? To walk like normal people. I say to her, okay, okay, we will walk normally. And this is exactly what we've been doing. Nothing different, and she still bangs on the floor and gives us nasty looks. But we're being normal people who walk around normal and don't stomp around. Our dog is a normal dog, who chews on bones and walks from his bed to his food bowl and gets excited when it's time for walkies, so we are normal. We'll be moving in the next month, so it's no skin off my back. I hope the next tenant doesn't have kids, or maybe I do. And then she'll finally understand that we're normal people who walk normal. And maybe she'll even miss us. All I can say is, that's apartment life for you right there, and I do feel bad for the woman, like, she sounded so high-strung and stressed out. And guys, I have to tell you about this man who lived below us when I was little. So, when I was really, really little, like, around 7 years old, my parents and the four of us lived in an apartment. And now that I'm older, I feel so bad for the guy who lived below us. The guy was the nicest old man ever, he was like 70 years old, like, 20 years ago, so he might have passed already. But the guy never once asked us to be quiet while we were playing, and trust me, my brothers and I were little hooligans. We were like jumping up and down, playing indoor hockey in the hallways, you name it. And one day, the guy actually came and talked to my mom because we were too quiet. The guy comes and knocks on our door and was like, what's going on? I've noticed that your kids have been really quiet. And my mom was like, oh, they're all sick. And that's when the old man told my mom that he loved hearing us run and having fun because it made him feel less lonely when there was noise around him. And at the time, I was like 7 years old and I didn't think much of it, but reading this post, guys, I realized what a nice man he was. And he was definitely one in a million because everybody else would have been driven crazy by us kids living above them. 
So I used to be a chef in a Mexican restaurant in a small town in Australia, nearly 40 years ago. We were modestly popular, and I loved working there. One night, a young man comes in to dine with a young lady. It was very obvious that it was a first date. They ordered nachos to share with a side of jalapenos for their entree, and he orders a steak Veracruz, hot for his main. And the young lady ordered a chicken burrito. I, as I usually did throughout the night, would walk around the tables and ask if people were enjoying the food. After the nachos, I checked on them. And the young man informed me that the chili accompanied by the nachos were not hot at all, and he loved hot food. I was then informed that he had traveled extensively, and he had eaten some of the world's hottest food, and that no one has ever made a dish that was too hot for him. He reiterated that he wanted his steak main extra hot. To be honest, I found him to be pompous and rather obnoxious in the way he was talking to me and I found myself taking a disliking to him. Now, I will add at this point that the young lady was looking a little uncomfortable, and I got the impression that her date was not going as she expected. So I head to the kitchen. I made her a lovely chicken burrito while putting together his steak. If the guy wanted it hot, he was gonna get it hot. Our steak Veracruz was usually a steak cooked and topped with our house tomato base, with some bell peppers, onions, and a touch of chili. On this occasion, I set to work. Keep in mind that this was Australia back in the 80s, and we didn't get a lot of different chilies back then, and jalapenos were considered hot by most Aussie palates. I had a few bird's eye chilies in the kitchen that were mainly there for the staff meals, so I started with those. I finally diced about 10 of those with their seeds. I then started sweating off my onions and the bell peppers, and then threw in the chilies, and then I added about a tablespoon of chili powder and a tablespoon of cayenne. I soon felt the fumes hit my nose and the back of my throat, and my eyes started watering. I then ran to the door of the kitchen to take a breath of breathable air, as the air in my tiny kitchen was rapidly becoming unbreathable. I ran back to my pan and put a ladle of the house tomato sauce in. I then let that simmer for a few minutes. I also added some chopped up jalapenos from a jar in my fridge, and thought why not, and went in with a bit more chili powder. I then put the steak in to finish it off in the sauce. I served it up all on a plate with some rice, served up the chicken burrito, and hit the bell for the waitress to serve it to the table. The waitress came back and told me that as she placed it in front of him, he said this had better be hot. She assured him that the chef had done as he requested. I then went to the door of the kitchen, joined by my waitress to watch the show unfold, and unfold it did. I watched with glee as he sliced the steak, took a piece of it on his fork, and with a smug look on his face, put it into his mouth. He started to chew and realized his mistake, and I saw it. That moment when his face changed, but he was trying so hard not to show it, and he couldn't. The guy was on a date, and he bragged so hard, and now he had to go through with it. He ate the whole steak, and I could see every ounce of pain in his face. The guy struggled, and he struggled hard. His date watched him with a slight smile on her lips, and I got the impression that she was thoroughly enjoying his pain. He went through several jugs of water, and he sweated, barely spoke, and he looked damn uncomfortable. At the end of the meal, I came out of the kitchen, and I asked him if he enjoyed his meal. And his exact words were, it could have been hotter. The guy never came back. As for his date, she became a regular, and she told us that he was an insufferable fool, and she never saw him again. I have no regrets other than I wish Carolina Reapers had been around back then. Oh, guys, <laughs> bragging that you can handle hot foods and not being able to is super cringy, especially on a first date. And I'm glad to know that the guy got what he deserved for acting like a pompous idiot. But with that said, I will give him props, though, for eating the whole steak. And I do wonder how it was coming out the next day, though. So this story happened to a friend of mine. Let's call him Bobby. Bobby was a CNC machinist, and a good one. The only one. The company he worked for made an intricate product, and his CNC part was crucial. The rest of the product bolted onto it. The finished product sold for tens of thousands of dollars. Now it took him three hours to make this piece. Bobby would make three a day. He'd make one in the morning, take his coffee break, then make another, and take his lunch break. That ate up about 6.75 hours. He'd then stay late to make the third part, and make two hours overtime. His new foreman turned out to be more than a bit of a jerk. He tried to get Bobby to do other tasks, and Bobby said no, as he needed to watch the CNC machine during all stages of the cycle. The foreman then bitched about it to the plant manager, who told him to back off and leave Bobby alone. One day, there was a bad snowstorm, and Bobby was 10 minutes late, and the foreman was there to greet him at the time clock, with a grin on his face, 
holding a demerit slip. Bobby had clocked in a minute late the previous week, and the union rule said that if you were late twice within 14 days, you got 20 demerit points. Bobby and the foreman got into a bit of an animated conversation, and the union steward came over and said that Bobby had no choice but to take the demerit hit. So Bobby went to work. His shift was from 8am to 4.30pm, but he usually stayed until 6.30 to finish the last part. But not today. At 4.30, he shut the machine down and he headed for the door. The next morning, the foreman comes over and says that the assembly team is short a part. Bobby says, yeah, I know, I'm working on it right now, I'll be done in two hours. The foreman says to him, but they need three a day, why didn't you make three yesterday? Bobby then tells him, because my shift is over at 4.30, and I went home. The foreman then says to him, what? But you stay every night until the third part is finished. And that's when Bobby pulls out the demerit slip out of his pocket. He then looks the foreman in the eye and said, not anymore. Bobby had done the math. Every week, instead of getting 15 parts, they were getting 10 or 11 parts. The manager tried to sweep it under the rug, but within a few days, chaos ensued. The assemblers had no core parts, and their team went to the plant manager to let him know that the production was falling. The assemblers liked it though, they got to hang around yakking while waiting for the next CNC part to arrive. Eventually, there was a meeting with the plant manager, the foreman, the union steward, and Bobby. The foreman tried to throw Bobby under the bus saying that he refused overtime. The union steward pointed out that as per the contract, mandatory overtime was only in the case of emergencies. And this wasn't an emergency. Bobby had every right to decline overtime. That's when the foreman lost his temper, started yelling at Bobby and the union steward, and he was asked to leave the meeting. The plant manager knew that he was screwed, and then he looked at Bobby and said, so what's it gonna take to get you to work overtime? At that, Bobby smiled and said, as long as the foreman's my supervisor, I won't be working a minute of overtime. And that was the last anyone saw the foreman. By sticking to the contract, Bobby cost the company a handful of parts worth many thousands of dollars and put the company into a position where their lowered production would cost them even more in perpetuity. Bobby had to work a couple of Saturdays to catch up and he made double time for those shifts. They then hired a new foreman who was explicitly instructed, do not under any circumstances F with Bobby. Guys, I love how Bobby is basically the guy who keeps the shop running, and he's valued so much that he got the foreman fired by saying one sentence. But I also have to say that the company should look into training someone else, or, or, or hiring a backup or something, because what if something were to happen to Bobby? Like, what if he had to go on medical leave, or quit? That place sounds like it would fall apart. I used to work at a mom and pop store that sold clothes, farm supplies, animals, and sporting goods. Anyways, since we sold sporting goods, we also sold bait fish. Fishermen would frequently stop by our store to buy them to fish with, and they were sold by the dozen. Usually when I scooped baits, I would give a few extra fish to my customers. So I had this one Russian lady come in, a Karen, to purchase bait fish. Just as I normally did, I scooped a net full of fish and started dumping them into a bag, counting them individually, and then added a few extra to the bag. The lady watched me do this, but insisted that I did not give her the correct amount. I ensured her that I not only gave her the dozen she paid for, but I also gave her a few extra. I literally just counted, and I've done this long enough that I was really good at eyeing when it was over a dozen, but the lady kept insisting that I didn't give her enough. So I said, okay, let's count together just to be sure. So I dumped all the fish from the bag back into the nets and we started counting together very slowly. 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. We get to 12 and it's very clear that there's several extra fish in the net. And that's when I look up at her and say, oh, you were right. I did not give you the right amount. I then proceeded to dump the remaining fish back into the tank right in front of her and gave her exactly the amount that she paid for. The woman ended up looking bewildered when I handed the fish back to her and she left. Now there was really nothing more she could have done at that point, but I did start applying that philosophy to the customers who bought crickets. And that my friends brings us to another end of our slash malicious compliance. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's stories. If you did, hit that thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so you don't miss these crazy wicked stories. And if you guys missed the last episode on the channel, I'll link it right here. It's an r slash entitled people episode where a sheriff lets his son destroy Opie's property because he is the law. And the guy gets taught a lesson that he won't ever forget. Go check it out if you haven't, and myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.